Hi, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Ronaldo. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very, very well. Good morning. How are you? It's I'm doing okay. Yeah, doing okay. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the, to the meeting. I apologize for coming on late. I was having some problems with my Zoom. Okay. Oh, no problem. And glad, glad you got those problems resolved and looking forward to talking to you. Yes, welcome to another, welcome to the show. I am so happy that you are on. Um, for those of us, I'm, I'm going to be joining, I'm going to officially do the announcement. But um, yeah. for, but I just, I just um, was reading a newspaper regarding the, um, the Haiti situation, but we'll get into that a little bit. I'm looking okay. forward to that. Yeah, man. Um, but how is your morning so far? Uh, it's been, been okay, been busy, but uh, going, going okay. All right, all right, and we will begin as we are ready. Welcome to another episode of the Nearly Well Podcast. I am Ronaldo McKenzie. And of course, today we have with us the Executive Director, Brian Conkanen, of the Institute for Democracy and Justice in Haiti. Did I get that right? Actually, it's justice and democracy, so we think you need justice <laughs> before democracy, although you can certainly argue the other way. <laughs> Yes, I have been. I have been making some mistakes, and I, I listened to a podcast I did, and I saw. I said, "Oh, I said some." I was saying um, the international, but then I realized no, it's the Institute for Justice and um, and Democracy in Haiti. And Mr. Brian, you are the founder and the executive um, director for the Institute for Justice for Democracy and Justice in Haiti. Welcome to the interview. Welcome to the Nilo Boron Podcast. Well, thank you, Ronaldo. I'm really looking forward to talking about Haiti with you and grateful that you invited me to join you. Yes, yes. You know, and I te- I'm so happy that we had this connection because I teach a class, Caribbean Thought, that looks at Caribbean thinking, but not just within the Caribbean, but just how the- we look at how the world is connected because there are people within the local. And of course, you have people in the diaspora. The diaspora is huge. And um and I've been coming to the U.S. I started coming to the U.S. in 2006. And I remember I was in Florida and I meet, and, I, and actually I went to Jamaica Theological Seminary. The former president of the Jamaica Theological Seminary was from Haiti. And um, when I was going to JTS, Jamaica Theological Seminary, Dr. Jumum Noelis was the president of Haiti at the time. And um, Haiti has had quite an interesting experience. And um, so it's quite interesting that um, we have an institute like yours working with Haiti. Now tell me, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got the, and I know you are, you started the, the, the IGHD, the Institute for the Democracy and Justice in Haiti. Am I right? Am I getting it right? IJDH. It's, you know, it's hard to say in English. We keep thinking we want to change the name, but it runs off your tongue in French or Haitian Creole. Yes. It's IJDH and Creole, and it works I-G-D-H. really well. English is okay. tough. <laughs> IJDH, yes. Exactly. Tell, yep. How did you get started? How did this start? You know, before I get to that, Ronald, Ronald yeah. I want to talk, I want to say something about how grateful I am for you to try to integrate Haiti into your discussion of broader Caribbean thought. Because Haiti has been, you know, the powers of the world have tried to keep that from happening ever since Haiti's independence. I mean, they they wanted to contain the contagion of freedom. 1804, Haiti becomes a free state beating of all people, Napoleon, at the height of his powers. The last thing that England, Spain, Portugal, France wanted was that example being spread. And, and, and the, the world has spent the last 200 plus years trying to prevent Haiti's example from going to other places. You know, obviously the example got far enough that, you know, that in the decades that followed, you did have, have um, abolition in Haiti. And then in the century that followed some independence. Um, But even now, you know, there's very few direct flights from Haiti to anywhere else in the Caribbean. Most of the time you want to go somewhere in the Caribbean, you have to go through Miami, which means a U.S. visa, which means who's controlling it. Um, And, and, you know, whenever you get too, too often, even though Haiti is a member of CARICOM, you know, th- there are there are barriers of language, barriers of culture, but also the, the United States actually works hard on other CARICOM countries to prevent them from from uh, 
you know, from really acting in solidarity with Haiti. So I really appreciate that, you know, that this podcast and you bringing this in is really an act of resistance against 200 years of trying to keep Haiti out of the rest of the Caribbean. That is so true. It's been, you know, I remember doing history. It was one of my favorite subjects in high school. Mm -hmm. And we learned about Haiti being one of the first Caribbean countries, the first country in the Caribbean that, that got their independence. So one of the first, not even, not only in Africa, not only Caribbean, one of the first black countries that was colonized and got independent. And then we talked about the Haitian Revolution and the French Revolution and how these, and that was a problem. But then, you know, fast forward several years later, you know, they've had a lot, of, you have the French influence and you have the US influence, the Spanish. And then of course there is the, the, the tug of war between um, Santo Domingo and Haiti and so on and so forth. But Haiti has had quite a lot of, um, had, has had a rich history. And, um, you know, Rastafarians in Jamaica looked to Rastafari in Ethiopia because they wanted a religion that speaks to the black consciousness and freedom. And, um, but Haiti was never, you know, growing up as a boy, you never hear people talking about Haiti. And to be honest, there was this, there was as if there was this, there was this tension between Jamaica and Haiti and or the Caribbean and the other and Jamaica, and Jamaica they speak English although sometimes they confuse Jamaica with Haiti um, they speak Creole in Haiti but um, other than that they speak French but there is, but we've always thought that Haiti was just so there was there's something happening with Haiti but then we saw the we saw the conflict and the tension in the U.S. penetration I mentioned this to my class U.S. interference in the Caribbean and now, and I have to start with this, and, and I, I know you sent an email and I read it earlier today and I said, wow, I just read a story where the Jamaican government is thinking about sending a troop to Haiti. They may have already done it, I'm not sure, but right now Jamaicans are opposed to it. But the thing is, the US is opposed to it. They don't really want to send anybody to, to Haiti. Especially well, the, the US wants to send people to Haiti the U.S. does not want to send white U.S. soldiers to Haiti. And that's what the Jamaica announcement is all about. So the U.S., they, they, they know that Haitians will dislike the mission. They know that Haitians, you know, have been res resisting foreign interference since since they beat Napoleon. And, yeah. and the U.S. wants foreign troops in Haiti, but does not want to pay the political cost of having white U.S. soldiers having to shoot into crowds of black Haitians. So what they're trying to do is to, they're trying to outsource it. And, and they've kind of, the U.S. has asked Canada to, has deputized Canada to go around the Caribbean and to ask people to, to join the troops. And they started this back in October. And initially it did not work. No one jumped on. I think, I think Ralph Gonzalez of, of St. Vincent was, was the most articulate saying, hey, look, we'll be seen as propping up a, a, a government that is illegitimate and doing international communities bidding we can't do that we should only send troops if there's a political solution and everybody else seemed to agree to that although everybody was quiet about it you know i'm not sure what the recent announcement by jamaica is maybe jamaica thinks that there's no chance that this mission is going to happen so that at least they can carry favor but it is clearly you know, not something that Haitians want. And it's something that, you know, that Haitians, all of, you know, I'll, I'll be, to be honest, many Haitians who are, you know, feel they have no other option. They're cowering every day under, you know, uh, from gang violence. They think, okay, uh, the only possible solution that the international community will let happen is foreign intervention. But every political party not connected with the government, civil society organizations, human rights groups, journalists, Every single public statement has been on the intervention in Haiti has been against that intervention. Um, my colleague Mario Joseph actually wrote a very eloquent letter to, to CARICOM uh, yes. explaining and I would love to get why. A copy of that. If you could send that to me, that would be great because I would love to see, see a copy of that. As soon that as we're letter. done, you'll have a copy. Yes, but you said, so he wrote a letter to CARICOM. Yes. Uh, back in October, when it was suggested, you know, explaining 
why it was a bad idea. And you know, starting with as you mentioned, you know, back to 1804, this was this was the beginning of Caricom liberation, and and yes. and, and he felt you know that by by supporting an intervention that is being being developed by former slave owning countries to come yeah. into Haiti to prop up a, an unpopular government is a betrayal of Haiti's um, of Haiti's revolution and all that it means for the, you know, the Afro descendant world. He also felt, and this is actually really important. He felt it was a betrayal of the example that CARICOM set in, in 2004. So Two centuries ahead of 1804, you get to 2004, the U.S. kidnapped Haiti's elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, and sent him in, in exile, um, first to, to, the, um, to the Central African Republic, which was very dangerous for him, and then Jamaica um, hosted uh, President Aristide for a few weeks, but the U.S. Yeah. was putting so much pressure that they could only do that temporarily, and then, and then President Aristide eventually got safety in South Africa. But along that, CARICOM really stood up for democracy because CARICOM has within its charter has democracy provisions it says you know this is a CARICOM is an organization of de democracies if there is an interruption in, in in the democratic order that has consequences for membership and CARICOM never recognized the de facto government that took over by contrast okay. The Organization of American States, of which CARICOM is half the membership, first of all, almost half the membership, has identical democracy provisions, and they refuse to even have a debate about implementing them. And again, it's because the OAS is 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 dominated by by the United States. CARICOM, you know, obviously the U.S. can apply a lot of pressure on on, on small countries in CARICOM with tourism bans and travel bans and things like that. Despite yeah. threats of that, CARICOM stood up and they said, we're under pressure, but we care about democracy, and they resisted it. Um, and that's one of the things that Mario Joseph said, hey, look, CARICOM showed the world what principled reaction to a democratic threat meant. And, and by sending troops now, it would betray that, that, uh, that, that example. Um, and, um, and thank you for, let, for, um, for bringing this to my attention. This is, this is major news. Um, I don't know how involved Jamaican and the Caribbean people are, what is going on and what the governments are doing. And, you know, I've talked about this. This is as Caribbean people. I mean, I'm, I'm Caribbean diaspora now. I'm a U.S. citizen, but I'm, I'm, I'm still connected to the, to the Caribbean and to Jamaica. And, and I, I study our history. I study what has dogged us, what has kept Caribbean people down. And the great thing is that I wrote, I've, I've written a book. I've had coming to this country. I've had great opportunity to study the Caribbean some more as an academic. So, and I'm still discovering more things. And of course, the unity of the Caribbean, but the fact that it's as well, sometimes the Caribbean people don't know what the governments are doing, the deals that they're making. But, um, but outside of that, you're an international organization that's here helping to bring light, shedding light about what's going on in the world and also to promote um, human rights and human justice. Tell me a little bit about your the work that you, your organization do in Haiti and when you started and how it's been. Sure. So I first actually went to Haiti with the United Nations uh, back in 1995. And this was, um, without going, you know, and Haitians will always give a very long historical answer to these kinds of questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm happy to do false. I'll be a little bit more brief than that. I'll just only go back to 1991. So 1991, there was a coup d'etat. Haiti's first democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, was overthrown. Um, there was three and a half years of, of, a, of a pretty brutal, repressive dictatorship. Then in 1994, democracy was 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 returned with a an intervention force. And it's important. That's that's an acceptable intervention force. It was it was. Uh, um, requested by Haiti's democratically elected government and it had broad support in the international community uh, CARICOM troops were part CARICOM country troops were part of that and yes. it was there to restore democracy rather than to prop up a dictatorship so I, I, I followed in that there was a UN human rights mission um, I went I went as a UN volunteer to, to to join that mission to try to you know do what I could to help build up Haiti's justice system and the rule of law in Haiti um, I left the UN after about nine months and joined a 
a group of lawyers called the, uh, in French, the Bureau des Avocats Internationaux, or BAI, um, an English International Lawyers Office. And what we were trying to do, we were actually a group that was set up by Haiti's government. And our purpose was to, we weren't we were independent of like the Ministry of Justice and the courts and things like that. We were an independent group that was set up. The government wanted us to apply pressure on its own system because it knew that you know, you'd had an elected president, you had a fairly elected legislature, but the judicial branch, which isn't elected, is would be much slower in democratizing. And the government yeah. said, okay, we're going to create this group of people that are going to put pressure on the system to help help speed up its democratization and the way we work we combined uh prominent cases we did you know, major human rights cases that had broad public interest and we did legal work we filed complaints um you know went to court things like that but we combined it but that wasn't enough because the system was 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 not democratic it had developed over centuries Ronaldo. I am not. Hi, how are you? Hi. I am not I'm sure doing what well. happened. I am. I come up. I don't know what happened. The, the yeah, computer I, I don't either. Just kind of went out. I mean, it might have been my it end. But... My mic was working. The thing was plugged in. Everything was working fine. And I'm not sure. But this is what happened when you're working with algorithms. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going. I'm so sorry. No. Um, uh, but I have it on record. It's been recorded on audio as well. So I may lose the video recording. I'm not sure. Hopefully I don't. But I have, have it also been. It's, it's audio and video. And we're also writing articles. So this is great. So sorry about okay. that. I, uh, so now you were talking about how you got started. Um, how your in yeah. organization got started in Haiti. And sorry yeah. about You can so take a so at the time, the, the justice system had for centuries evolved to serve whoever in Haiti had the guns and the money. And, and what the government wanted to do was to help transition it to serving the people and the law. And so yeah. they, they started uh, the, the BAI as, as a, um, a way of applying pressure on the system. And the way we did it was we filed lawsuits and went to court. But that would not be enough because the system was not set up to serve the people. And okay. uh, we were the lawsuits we were filing were for large massacres. So we we're going after generals, paramilitary leaders, very powerful people. And and so we combined the legal work with organizing work. We helped the victims demonstrate, you know, do demonstrations, write letters, whatever they could do to put pressure on the system to get it to function democratically. And that actually worked well. Um, our most prominent case was called the Roboto trial. We convicted the entire military high command, several top paramilitary officials. The trial was lauded by, you know, by human rights groups, by the UN, by everyone as fair, not just to the victims who we represented, but also to the to the defendants. All their rights were scrupulously respected, and you ended up having a fair judgment. That's been considered a model for, for. Um, for justice in complicated cases in, in transitional societies. Yeah, um, yeah. But as we were having that success, there was also success in other areas. So this was a, about a 10 year experimentation in democracy that Haiti had, and that we had the success right. in the justice system. There was success in education. They built more secondary schools in those 10 years than it built in Haiti's history. Uh, there were there was successes in in hospitals. Nice, the nice. Public hospitals yeah. were built up. Haiti developed this partnership with Cuba where they were training. Um, you know, Cuba agreed to train hundreds of Haitian doctors and, and, Cuba, and yeah. Cuba sent hundreds of its own medical personnel to go to remote areas in Haiti. Um, there were... The economy got better, employment, literacy, across the board, you had these improvements. The problem was, was that Haiti's government insisted on, on rejecting the neoliberal model of, of, of development that was, that was the dogma at the time. And so you're yeah. getting a lot of pressure from, from the international community to reduce the government's role in the economy. Um, you know, this was something that Haitians didn't understand. You know, they had a country where half of the people, half the school age kids weren't in school. Why should you be cutting uh, education spending? And the international community said, no, Haiti's system should be even more privatized, even though it was the second most privatized country 
in education system in the world and it was clearly not working for half of the kids. Um, yeah. Haiti's government wanted to increase the spending in on, on health care. Um, and at the time, that was just not acceptable to the people who ran the world. And so they slapped a development assistance embargo on Haiti, led by the United States, but Canada, the EU, even organizations like the Inter-American oh. Development Bank yeah. agreed to participate in this. They canceled a clean water, uh, two $400 million clean water systems. Um, you know, how you can justify on any grounds stopping clean water in a place where 3,000 kids a year were dying of diarrheal diseases is beyond yes. me. But that's but the but what the the development assistance embargo did was and it worked. I mean, it was designed to hurt Haiti's poor and to make them less supportive of the government and, and decrease the government's ability to provide basic government services. That worked spectacularly in 2004. Um, a group of, of rebels that were that were training somewhat openly and had been denounced by Haiti for years. Uh, they were training across the border in the Dominican Republic. They came across, they started taking over uh, Haitian cities and, and, and police stations and other, other government offices. Um, that was recently? To, this recently. was in 2004. This was oh, 2004. Wow. wow, wow, wow. This is quite interesting. So, uh, so there seemed this tension between the two countries continue today. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, today, even last week, d Haitians are being deported from the Dominican Republic. So, yes, you still oh, have that. Wow. You know, a yes, but yes, but yes. yeah, in, in 2004, Dominican Republic, I mean, everybody knew this. This was this was, you know, the Haitian where they were arresting people coming across doing incursions. But then the U.S. and the Dominican Republic, they would deny that this was happening, even though yes, you know, yes. people were getting killed and getting arrested. And it was everybody knew this was happening. Uh, 2004. Ronaldo? I am not hi, how are you? Hi. I am not I'm sure doing what well. happened. I am I come up I don't know what happened. The, the yeah, computer I, I don't either, just kind of went out. I mean it might have been my it end, but out. my mic was working, the thing was plugged in, everything was working fine, and I'm not sure, but this is what happened when you're working with algorithms. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what's going. I'm so sorry. No, um uh but i have it on record it's been recorded on audio as well so i may lose the video recording i'm not sure hopefully i don't but i have it also been it's, it's audio and video and we're also writing articles so this is great so sorry about that okay. i uh, so now you were talking about how you got started um how your yeah. organization got started in haiti and sorry yeah. about you can so pick up your so at the time, the, the justice system had for centuries evolved to serve whoever in Haiti had the guns and the money. And, and what the government wanted to do was to help transition it to serving the people and the law. And so yeah. they, they started uh, the, the BAI as, as a, um, a way of applying pressure on the system. And the way we did it was we filed lawsuits and went to court. But that would not be enough because the system was not set up to serve the people. And okay. uh, we were the lawsuits we were filing were for large massacres. So we we're going after generals, paramilitary leaders, very powerful people. And and so we combined the legal work with organizing work. We helped the victims demonstrate, you know, do demonstrations, write letters, whatever they could do to put pressure on the system to get it to function democratically. And that actually worked well. Um, yeah. Our most yeah. prominent case was called yeah. the Rabato trial. We convicted the entire military high command, several top paramilitary officials. The trial was lauded by, you know, by human rights groups, by the UN, by everyone as fair, not just to the victims who we represented, but also to the, to the defendants. All their rights were scrupulously respected and you ended up having a fair judgment. That's been considered a model for, for, um, for justice in complicated cases in, in transitional societies. Yeah, um, yeah. But as we were having that success, there was also success in other areas. You know, so this was a, about a 10 year experimentation in democracy that Haiti had, and that we had the success right. in the justice system. There was success in education. They built more secondary schools in those 10 years than it built in Haiti's history. Uh, there were there was successes in, in hospitals. Right. The right. public hospitals yeah. were built up. Haiti developed this partnership with Cuba, where they were training, um, you know, Cuba agreed to train hundreds of 
Haitian doctors and, and, Cuba, and yeah. Cuba sent hundreds of its own medical personnel to go to remote areas in Haiti. Um, there were the economy got better, employment, literacy across the board. You had these improvements. The problem was, was that Haiti's government insisted on on rejecting the neoliberal model of, of, of development that was that was the dogma at the time. And so yeah, you're getting yeah. a lot of pressure from from the international community to reduce the government's role in the economy. Um, you know, this was something that Haitians didn't understand. You know, they had a country where half of the people, half the school aged kids weren't in school. Why should you be cutting uh, education spending? And the international community said, no, Haiti's system should be even more privatized, even though it was the second most privatized country in education system in the world, and it was clearly not working for half of the kids. Um, yes. Haiti's government wanted to increase the spending in on, on health care. Um, and at the time, that was just not acceptable to the people who ran the world. And so they slapped a development assistance embargo on Haiti, led by the United States, but Canada, the EU, even organizations like the Inter-American oh. Development Bank yeah. agreed to participate in this. They canceled a clean water, uh, two $400 million clean water systems. Um, you know, how you can justify on any ground stopping clean water in a place where 3,000 kids a year were dying of diarrheal diseases is beyond yes. me but that's but the but what the the development assistance embargo did was and it worked i mean it was designed to hurt haiti's poor and to make them less supportive of the government and and decrease the government's ability to provide basic government services that worked spectacularly in 2004 um a group of of rebels that were that were training somewhat openly and had been denounced by Haiti for years. Uh, they were training across the border in the Dominican Republic. They came across, they started taking over uh, Haitian cities and, and, and police stations and other, other government offices. Um, that was you recently? To, this Recent was in 2004. This was oh, 2004. Wow. wow, wow, wow. This is quite interesting. So, uh, so there, it seemed this tension between the two countries continue today. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, today, even last week, the Haitians are being deported from the Dominican Republic. So, yes, you still oh, have that. Wow. You know, a yes, lot. But yes, but yes. yeah, in, in 2004, Dominican Republic, I mean, everybody knew this. This was this was, you know, the Haitian where they were arresting people coming across doing incursions. But then the U.S. and the Dominican Republic, they would deny that this was happening, even though yes, you know, yes. people were getting killed and getting arrested. And it was everybody knew this was happening. Uh, 2015 uh, months no. ago. No one has been formally charged in his assassination. Um, who's running the country is is a prime minister. The prime minister was named by the president uh, the day before he was assassinated, but was never installed. The way that the prime minister was installed was literally by a press release by the core group. The core group is a group of countries, uh, including the United States, Canada, Spain, Germany, France, and the European Union, also Brazil, I think, and and that that are supposed to be this kind of group of of interest around Haiti. But in fact, they're a group of governance around Haiti. They literally chose Prime Minister Henri as Prime Minister. There was another Prime Minister who had always already been in office. He'd been in office for several months, and the core group initially said. Uh, Claude Joseph, the, the existing prime minister, will stay in office. Then a week later, they changed course and said, no, now it's going to be Dr. Ariel Henry. And that is what did the changeover. There was no Haitian mechanism, no Haitian constitution, no Haitian political parties, no decisions made in Haiti. It was all decisions made abroad that said, OK, this is who's going to run Haiti. Um, and and since then, they've now it's been 20. It's been it's been about 15 months. The. Um, the government it's 18 months the government keeps acting there's there's the last elected officials were 10 senators who who became their their mandates ended on on january 9th of this year but they hadn't been doing anything for for three years because three years before that the rest of the legislature the rest of parliament um, they lost their term so you've basically had for three years you've had 10 members of parliament they can't vote um but but so uh, since then, for three years now, you've had no legislature. Um, two and a half years ago, all the elected local officials, and there's thousands of them, um, they their terms ended. The government said, OK, well, we're just going to name people. 
you know, waddled yeah. over their friends as that. No accountability. Um, there's no, you know, the, 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 there's been no election at all now in, in Haiti in seven years. Um, and wow. there are no elections planned. The Supreme court speaking of accountability the supreme court does not have enough members to sit to hear cases so there's yeah, no yeah. There's very limited judicial accountability this has really been a dismantling of haiti's democracy over the last yes. 11 years with international community support so is, is it as if that um the kind of it, i mean i was just re, i mean read right up Haiti, the first black nation to be a republic the first to be independent so on and so forth i mean Haiti was was a uh, was uh, uh, an, uh, an, a country that was just had a lot of pride and joy. There was a lot of expectations and hope for Haiti, but you know it's just been as soon as they experience a little bit of advantage or freedom or independence, just if they go right back into it. I mean, what is? Uh, but now it's as if now they are colonized by the international community between the U.S. and and the other. Um, the other countries, um, Western nations, um, they, it's as if they are colonized again. And I think one of the reasons why um, I believe I was, I had an, ha an Haitian person interviewing recently, somebody who is from Haiti. Um, um, I interviewed somebody from Haiti recently. And she said to me, the people just won't come together. And she alluded to the fact that this prime, this president was assassinated. And, um, and I've been hearing from on the ground, and I have people who I talk to on the ground, locals in Haiti, and they are telling me that um, many people were opposed to this Haitian, I'm sorry, to the, to the former president of Haiti, and that um, they believe that he was a mouthpiece of the U.S. And, you know, this seems to be part of the, you know, how can the U.S. influence a country that where they, the, the, the people in this country, they have a, they're suspicious of the U.S. They're suspicious of the international machinery. How is it that that the U.S. is going to provide the answer? Don't isn't it something that we can do to move beyond this, doing the same thing and getting the same result? Because these people are looking. They want independence. They want to do it themselves. They want independence. They want that pride. I think that's the main, the most important thing. And they want independence, but it's as if they're not given a chance to experience. And to experiment with their independence because of outside interference. I don't know how 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 do you see it from where you sit? Yeah, the way I see it is, I wouldn't say I would push back a little bit on your yeah. comment that Haiti's being colonized again. I think Haiti has <laughs> never not been colonized, yeah. and and you know, and Haitians would say explain this much better than I. They can yeah. draw a direct line, and you know, I'll yeah. hit some of the highlights without cutting too much That's detail. <laughs> we bring on a highlight a Haitian in for the ten hour version of this. But, yes, you know, yes. But that's how they feel. What I just said. That's how they feel. I feel like though they're yep. being colored. Yeah. It's, it's but so you know, much. 1804, Haiti becomes independent. The U.S. Yeah. would not recognize Haiti's independence until 1864. Until in our country, we freed our own slaves. Um, yes, so yes, we yes. refused to allow Haiti, and and this was this was this was very public in you know in government statements from from most of the the powerful countries, which became powerful through the slave trade. They said yeah. we cannot allow Haiti's example to succeed because yeah. you know of course if you've got slaves in Jamaica, you've got slaves in South Carolina, you don't want to see them to see hey here's a successful country run by free slaves because it completely right. undercuts all your justification that somehow blacks were somehow deserving of this treatment because you know because they couldn't do better and and hey oh, Haiti was wow. trying to do well, better this is, this is, that's a powerful point you just made man that, yep, that's that's powerful. That, this... that's a powerful point you just made i mean you said that it's, it's to set an example and you know i never it, i never thought about it in those ways and you just hit it on the, the nail on the head it was an you should go to Haiti. You learn how to do this. I didn't either, so I went to Haiti. And yes, speak but with Haitians, they teach you. Yes, but that was a powerful point. I had to stop you a little bit because you were going into it, and I want the yeah. people, I want them that to settle in a little bit. Yep. The fact that you know the, the the U.S. and other countries refused to acknowledge Haitian independence until 1864. So that was the U.S. So it gets right. worse, though. So France recognized it in 1825, but the only way France recognized it was that it, it exacted a debt from Haiti. So Haitians were forced to pay a debt to the French slave owners for their lost, yeah. quote, property. Some of that property mm -hmm. was land and cows and things like that, but a big chunk of that property was people. And yeah. so they were literally 
Haitians who had been freed by a successful revolution were forced to pay for their physical freedom to France. And the way that France forced, I mean, partly was recognition, but really it was France, France sent um, a whole fleet of gunboats to, to the port of Prince Harbor and said, we're going to blow all your capitals into smithereens if you don't you know, if you don't pay off and no one else, not Britain, not the U S no one else would have stopped France because again, everybody who was powerful wanted Haiti to fail. Now that debt was not paid off for over a hundred years. It kept getting refinanced and it prevented yeah. Haiti from developing because Haiti had to spend all its money in, in, in paying off the debt, you know, something that, that Jamaica is struggling with, you know, has struggled with recent history. Yes. It's the same idea. You impose this debt and that prevents the government, the, 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 um, prevents the the country from investing in education and infrastructure and economic yes, development yes. you have to put all your money into export agriculture or something like that that's going to you know pay off your debts and that's what they did for haiti for over 100 years haiti was kept down by this debt again intentionally this wasn't a collateral consequence this was the whole plan you couldn't let haiti succeed the longest u.s marine occupation in any country was in haiti um, it, the U.S. troops were there from from um, 1914, 1915 to 1934. So during World War One, the war to the, the 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 war to end all world wars, the U.S. had Marines to spare to make sure that Haiti did not succeed. Going up to 2004, Haiti and and this is a, something that should be you know a, a real big deal in the Caribbean. In 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 in, in, in 2003. President Aristide put together, we were part of, of, of doing this, he put together a legal claim for this, for this, for the death that the French, um, that the, the French forced on Haiti. Um, yes, I remember that. That is true. It was illegal. I, President yeah. Aristide puts together this claim and says, hey, look, we've got a case. And he had international lawyers from all over the world behind it. And, and, and he said, we're going to file this case against France. Um, and this was a dangerous case, not only because, I mean, it, 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 the calculation was, was that France owed Haiti $24 billion, which is a lot of money. But what was really worrying was that it would open the door to broader reparations. So let's say if France had to pay Haiti that $24 billion, you know, there's going to be a long line signing up. So all the African countries that France raided are going to start, you know, asking, okay, we deserve justice too. Other French you know, other French colonies are going to say we deserve justice too. British colonies, the same America, you know, it's going to open the door to a huge claim for reparations from and that people came whose back descendants back from were country. <laughs> and, and so what the response to that was, was France and the U S doing this kidnapping of president Aristide. That was their way of making the lawsuit go away. The French, there was a New York times about a year ago, did a, did a, a series on this. And they actually got the French ambassador at the time to admit this, that they did the coup to make the, 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 the Hades reparations restitution claim go away. Mm, wow. That is, this is powerful. This is, po this is powerful news. And, um, you know, I have, we've heard about the, we thought it was an extradition. But now we're hearing the kidnapping of, of, of Mr. Jean Bertrand Aristide. And I, I remember that was one of my favorite Haitian uh, presidents, actually. But yeah. um, yeah, no, it's literally, they, literally, there was a plane that, so the US had all these planes that they were using to, at the time, if you remember, there was this kind of war on terror. Where, and, yes. and as part of that, the US was taking people who were arrested and they were moving them to other countries where they could be tortured. And there were all yes. these clandestine flights. They had this whole fleet of planes. Um, and one of it was one of those planes took off from Guantanamo Bay, which was, you know, that was one of the places where people were being being held and tortured and things, and was sent to Haiti. And and the US ambassador, what they did was they kind of tricked Aristide to come to the airport. And they said, You can either and at the time there were, you know, the, the, there were there were there was unrest in Port-au-Prince, and they had they had separated yeah. Aristide from his from his from his bodyguards and he they said you can either walk home and this is late at night and we can't guarantee your safety or you can get onto this plane he got onto this plane onto the plane and he was with his wife too so was, you and your wife have to walk home you know probably certain death and and um then so they got on the plane they were kept incommunicado the plane followed filed a false flight plan and ended up taking them to the to the central african republic 
um, where that wasn't where Aristide requested. That was where the French had kind of set that up because they knew that they could control things in the Central African Republic. In fact, I, I landed there a few days after Aristide, and you could see as the plane landed, it was all French soldiers who were who were running things at the airport. Um, and so yeah, they really yeah. kind of put him there to keep him on ice so that this coup d'etat in Haiti could be consolidated. Oh, wow. This is quite, this is quite interesting learning, learning about what's going on in Haiti, but also learning about history. This is quite important. And, you know, you talk about, I, I, you, we talk about strategy. You went to Georgetown. I went to Georgetown. I mean, I'm in Georgetown. But um, they talk, and there's a course called Strategy. I really like that course in Strategy. And they also looked at that, uh, look at that. You, you can study the archives and look at Strategy. In colonization, there is Strategy. And we talk about uh, interventionist policy. Interventionist policy through structural adjustment, IDB, World Bank. In the 70s, a lot of Caribbean countries are familiar with that, um, where countries loan, a lot of first um, 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 global north countries, post industrial countries, lend money to the Caribbean. And then, of course, at high interest rates, which they are still paying back or can't pay back, which resembles the Haitian French situation where Haiti had to pay French France billions of dollars, which they never they stopped paying. In, not until about 2006 or something or 2004, I believe that was when they finally paid off the, the all of that. But it kept them down. It has beaten the, the, the economic and the social situation of the people in Haiti. But I believe, in a sense, the IMF, the World Bank, fast forward to the 1970s, is as if they learned how to keep former colonies down. Haiti did it with France, France did it with Haiti, and then by the 1960s, they're doing it again, which and so which is quite interesting. But the question and, for you... Know, one, yeah. one anecdote connecting that from the time, uh, I'm not sure if you ever had the privilege of meeting uh, John Maxwell, yes. the Jamaican journalist. Yes, wonderful oh, John, guy. Uh, no, and, no, the other John Maxwell. Sorry, but um, oh, okay. And, you know, I have never met John Maxwell. I should meet John Maxwell, and John Maxwell will be watching. He's going to watch this show. So okay, John oh, sorry. Maxwell, well, John yeah. Maxwell, I'm talking about, sadly passed away about ten years ago. Um, oh, that's he was, the socialist he, guy. That's the <laughs> yes, yeah. I know John. I know the John Maxwell. Yes, yes, but I've never so, met him. Never met him. In, yes. I, the one time I met him, I, 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 I. I uh, communicated with email for years with him. He was just very insightful and helpful and, and such a humane person, um, especially around this whole coup d'etat and, and kind of the Caribbean um, role in it. And when President Aristide was, was, you know, was able to escape the Central African Republic and, um, you know, and, and this was not easy. The way that, that, that happened was a plane was sent by, uh, that had Maxine Waters, who's a member of the U.S. Congress, who's very, adamant yes. to, for you know for supporting haiti supporting justice but they also they put on the uh, i think there's a foreign minister of jamaica and many other high vips and they literally went flew it into the central african republic and and maxine waters said i'm leaving with with president aristide and and they yes. said well we can't do that and the government because they were under orders from france and the u.s not to let that happen and maxine said okay i'm going to stay here and make some noise until i leave and you know so they called up and they got that was maxine. The france okay that's nice yeah. you're literally putting your life on the line saying i'm staying yes. here in this unstable country and if i get killed it's going to be a big mess and so so yes. that was what allowed and you know and having jamaican um Jamaican foreign minister on the plane, you know, that was literally to keep it from being shot down. Knew that right. if they had these officials, that the U.S. would not shoot down the plane with Aristide. And so they brought him back to Jamaica. And and I, I went down to, to, to meet with him with a delegation of, of, of human rights lawyers. Um, on the way, or actually after we were done with the meeting, I had a chance to spend an afternoon with, with, with John Maxwell and we were driving around and he was teaching at the uh, at the University of the West Indies. West Indies uh, yeah. I think it was the Mona campus. And as we yes, were driving yes, around, yes. I said, this is absolutely fantastic. I just, I wish Haiti could have something like this. And he looked sadly at me and said, I wish Jamaica could have something like this. And he started pointing out the buildings. And he said, that was this department. This was closed down four years ago because of, you know, budget cuts to pay off our loans. There's a journalism school. There's this school. And, and you know, I, I don't know what the situation is now. But at that point, like half of the building, these nice buildings were closed down because of budget cuts. And so, you know, Haiti calls itself the laboratory. And what they say is that 
that the international community tries out things on Haiti and yes. they work, then they yes. then they're, they're they're done elsewhere. And that was the laboratory theory there that you know they'd used they'd used debt to keep Haiti down, and it worked so well that they're now using debt to keep Jamaica and and, and other countries down. And yes, they are using debt, which you know as it was anecdotal, but as I speak with you and I and I think about it some more. With what, and I read about what's going on. To be honest, I, I, as a student of history, I don't some some history you're not exposed to. I don't know why. Some history, some history you you're kept from. I was yes, a history major. I knew nothing about Haiti. And you have to sit down and read. You have to if you don't do it, sit down and read for yourself. You'll never get it. You know, I'm from Jamaica. You know, and um, when you see what's going on, some of what I know about Haiti, I knew about Haiti while living here in the U.S. And I came here when I was 29. I'm 43 now. I'm going to be 44 this year. And, um, you know, and when you see, and, and I said to people, it's very important that you study history. Very important that we read widely about what's going on in society so that you can keep the pressure on your governments and on the, on the leaders because you never know what they're doing in the back room. <laughs> And this is what you have done with your Institute for Democracy, um, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, where you have you 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 saw the so to speak the BS. You saw what's going on in society and how people the international arrangements that keep certain people down. I thought there's a chapter in my in my new book where I talk about and the black position. The con um, it's of the black position. What is the black position in the world? And you know, if you study history, you know, and this history of strategy then you see the various ways in which um, black people in the world have been sidelined. But, it's, but here you are working hard to make a difference. What are some of the things that I know, and I know you work with the United Nations, what are some of the international organizations you are working with to help to, to, to um, resolve the situation, which is, not, which is also an issue, not just because there are people who believe that we blame the people, who want to blame the people. It's, you know, some people, some Haitians believe it's the Haitians themselves their inability to come together. And of course, there are those people who said, yes, that, but there's also the inter on the international stage. Yeah, I'm the government, the international, the US, um, the UK, and the Spain, France, and all these big countries that are still involved. They're still elite. They're still part of the dominant class or the dom their dominant people who are ruling these countries. Um, how, what, how, I know you said that it's, it's kind of difficult for you and your organization, but what are you doing? What are some of the organizations you are part of? And what's the next, and what's the next step for you guys and for you? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. And, and, and it's one we struggle with, with every day, you know, and one part of, you know, an extension of what you're saying about, about who's running the world. I mean, if you look at the UN security council, which is, you know, probably the most powerful body on earth, you know, perhaps aside from maybe the Chinese or the U.S. government, but, you know, certainly in a lot of these issues is the, the, the defining force. It's dominated by the five members of, of the five permanent members, which are France, Russia, China, uh, the U.S., and Great Britain. Three of those, so 60%, they got their position of power through the slave trade, through slavery. And, yeah. you know, so that is... That's, you know, we can, if you forget that, you know, I totally agree with you on remembering history, you forget that at your peril because that is, that is still, you know, their, their wealth was originally based on slavery. Now it's based on post-slavery exploitation of poor people. Yes. And it's the yes. same people. You know, the, the, the mechanism is different than slavery. I mean, fortunately, it's improved, but it's still the same people being exploited by, by the powerful countries to keep them keep them powerful. And, you know, yes. we need to keep that in mind. So we address international organizations. We file a complaint through the UN system, with the inter-American system, but we don't do it with any illusions. There are some people within those systems that want to help, and, and sometimes that does help. But we all obviously need to be aware that we're working within a system that is set up to prevent us from doing what we need yes. to do. So yes. everything yes. we do is based on being able to pressure those systems, whether it's the UN, the U.S. government, uh, members of Congress, we, um, what, of the U.S. Congress, that's uh, 
the you know the, the the Canadian government, all of this in order to apply pressure, we develop constituencies. We develop constituencies in the press by you know informing journalists who you know don't have enough time to really dig deep. And then yeah. we'll, if they don't dig deep, they'll listen to what the State Department says. That makes sense, and they'll write that down. You know, we engage with them and say, hey, here's the here's yeah. the history, here's the reality, here's what Haitians think. Um, we also work with Haitian American communities in the United States to help them um, make their voices heard. We we help Haitians. You know, within Haiti, make their voices heard through whether it's demonstrations or getting articles into the international press, uh, webinars, you know, whatever we can to help them exert the power they have in a way that can that can make a difference. So, you know, none of this, we don't have any illusions that that the international community is going to do right by Haiti because that's what the law says. We, yeah, uh, yeah, everything yeah. is based on the international community is only going to do is only going to respect Haitians rights and Haitian sovereignty to the extent that they're pressured to do so. Yes. Oh, wow. The pre- I love that last word you said to pressure. And that's where you come yep. to bear. So you apply pressure to um, human rights pressure and also and um, you're an attorney as well. Um, so you yes. provide that kind of legal pressure. So that's great. And um, now what, what about in terms of the Caribbean and the diaspora? I believe that there's something that the diaspora can do. You know, I believe that they have, they have been given opportunities. And I think that they can do much more in terms of the Caribbean, not just, I'm just sure you have the Caribbean community, CARICOM in, um, in the Caribbean that works to develop Caribbean interests, which I believe that what has dogged the Caribbean is that it's still weak, and I read an article in um, in in in, um, in the Jamaican Gleaner, written by Brad by Dan McGibbon. They found oil off Guyana, and he asked, "Is this the great? Is this a great opportunity for the Caribbean?" No, it is not, because in 1952 they found bauxite in Jamaica. Okay, yep. they've had oil in Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, so I I believe if all the Caribbean islands could come together, and I think from in 19 19- the idea was for us to come together. But the Treaty of Shagaramas, that was shot down, and then that led to a, a more watered-down treaty that the character which is now watered down. But I think if we can come, if they can come together, and they and 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 pool resources together, then probably they will help each each country, not just Haiti, what's going on in all their backyards, so, and work with the international community and people like your organization, what you are doing. What, what are some of the ways that people can get involved in, in what your organization is doing? Um, so sir, first, start with our website. It's www.ijdh.org or haitijustice.org works as well. Um, Justice, we have... Yeah. You know, we send out emails, um, we, you know, on action alerts, things like that. People can volunteer. Uh, people can donate. We're, you know, always, you know, we don't get funding from governments. They're obviously not going to fund us to challenge them. We don't get yes. uh, funding from the UN. So we rely on, on, you know, on donors. Most of our donors are just regular people who want to help. So we rely on that. Um, yes. And if, you know, people have any questions, reach out how, how, how you can help. You know, one, we've, we've reached out to people. Back, back, you know, at the time when, for example, when, when um, my colleague Mario Joseph wrote that letter back in 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 October to explain to Caricom yes. why it's problematic, we reached out to, to to our friends in the Caribbean and said, "Hey, pass this around to you know your elected officials, to journalists, to your friends. Let's just get this around so people in the Caribbean know what's at stake in Haiti." Um, so certainly, yeah. you know, love to anybody want to connect to. You know, to yes. pass around information, I'd be, and of course, Ronaldo, I'll, I'll send you the 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 uh, the letter. I mean, it's still, you know, yes, just please send me the letter. And just and we got disconnected, so I don't know if we if that was if the recording was affected. Hopefully, but earlier when we, you said that, so there was a letter by by Mar, um Miss by uh Gonzalez. Miss, no, that. Mario the the letter was from my colleague Mario Joseph, who's Haiti's most prominent human rights letter, and he wrote it to the CARICOM General Secretariat. That was that was in response to U.S. efforts to get Caribbean troops to come to Haiti to you know okay. so that they basically it would be black Caribbean troops doing the work of Canada and the U.S. because Canada and the U.S. knew did not want their white soldiers being seen shooting into Haitian crowds. And so they, they wanted CARICOM to come and do its dirty work. Um, my colleague, you know, that, you know, that's the problem. I'm sorry to interject. 
That's the problem. Go ahead. That is the problem with the U. I, you know, I don't know what's going on. That is the, this is the problem. They're worrying about optics, but they're doing the same thing. It's as if you don't learn. You know, you talk about the house slaves. Who beat the slaves in the field? You know, you talk about what happened in Africa and how Africa was dominated by Europe. How was it dominated? Two trickery, two tra strategy. They went, they made deals with one African tribe and then they, and then with other African tribe. But it's always, you make deals with one African country to get that, their brothers to go and go into another part. So it doesn't matter if they do it. It doesn't matter if they do it or the, it doesn't matter who is doing it. But I'm saying, what I, what I do not understand is here it is that they are sending, they want the Caribbean, the Caribbean to do, to go in and and a uh, 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 force, but at the same to lead a force. But what about Caribbean in terms of leading the discussions around around diplomacy, leading the discussions in terms of investing in the Caribbean? And what about the CARICOM leading the charge? It's enough. The UN. So I mean, that's sorry, exactly Canada. what CARICOM did in two thousand four. Okay. That's exactly what CARICOM did. CARICOM led discussions about returning democracy to Haiti. It led yeah. discussions about, hey, there's been a coup d'etat. The elected gov elected president is in South Africa. We've got to do something about that. Okay. That was immensely successful. Every time the U.S. tried to sweep it under the rugs and said, oh, everybody agrees with this coup d'etat, and everybody meant U.S., France, Canada, CARICOM said, hey, everybody doesn't. We're here. And, and, and that was a very powerful statement that really yeah, contributed yeah. to democracy getting back to Haiti. And CARICOM was successful, it was courageous, but it's now it's not doing that. And in part, yeah. and you know, again, you may know a lot more about this than I do, but from what my perspective, I think the U.S. learned its lesson. I think the U.S. said, okay, yeah. we're going to break CARICOM up. And I think a lot of the work around the, the you know, the OAS vote in, in um, on Venezuela where for the first time CARICOM kind of broke its consensus and you had some people supporting the ouster of Venezuela from the OS and some people defending uh, defending it. Um, and, and you know, I think that was very effective because it, you know, it broke up CARICOM unity. And for the exact reasons why you mentioned, unity is so important because as long as the U.S. can start picking people apart and, you know, saying, OK, Jamaica, you know, we'll give you this if you do this. And then, you know, you give each country what it wants. In the end, it's going to all the countries are going to do what the U.S. wants, which is going to hurt them all. And it's only you know, really by getting people together that you're going to be able to resist it. And that has been, you know, and that's one of the reasons that has got because, you know, in order for people to penetrate, in order for global for penetration to happen, then you have to still have this unity. You break up what's going on on the ground. Caribbean, the Caribbean, we are all small countries. And if we are able to have a stronger single market and economy, and that's part of the problem. You don't want a, a, a bad, a, a, the, um, another country rivaling other countries. That's part, you know, I believe that that's a major problem. We live in a very competitive world. And, um, and Caribbean people need to work, need to come together in a more stronger and deliberative way and a strategy, the word strategy is important. I, I can't say that word important. I mean, I mean, I can't stress, emphasize that word enough. Strategy. And I don't think, believe that they think in terms of strategy and how that they can, they can save face. And okay, they, because I, between, uh, I, between, in 2004, was it really between 1999 to 2004? Um, and I was at a seminar, seminary. I remember, um, following Haitian news a lot. And I saw CARICOM was very involved in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. That was, those were the twilight years. They were the beautiful. I mean, there still, there were still opportunities for change, but that was like the years when you believe that they were going in the right direction, you know? But there is always something to, something that affects, um, that derail the Caribbean. But the thing is, and that's why I said, that's always defined the Caribbean. Stagnation, vulnerable instability. They, as soon as you think that they are stable, they are unstable. And that's the question. Even, even today, they might be talking about, right, right, I read an article yesterday in the Gleaner. Crime is down in Jamaica by 31%. That is unheard of. I could not believe it. Crime. Jamaica is one of the, high, the highest crime, at the highest sure. crime rate in the world, one of the highest. 
But today it's down by 30, 31, 31, double digits. I couldn't believe it. 31%. But how long will that last? You know what I mean? And I think that's part of the problem. We're just, there's this instability. It's so schizophrenic. You, you know, you cannot. Yeah. And but, it's, you know, it's not, it's instability that is generated. I mean, if, yeah. you know, if Jamaica was not having to, for the last 20 years, devote a lot of money to paying back these loans, it could be, could have been investing in jobs, education, yeah. all of things that are proven to fight crime. I mean, as long yeah. as you have huge inequality, huge poverty, an inability of the government to provide basic government services, there's no way you're not going to have high crime. And, and so the, by the, by keeping Jamaica from investing in its people, the international community generated the crime that then keeps the Jamaican governments um, yes. vulnerable, which then, and, be, and because of that, now Jamaica has to rely outsize on, you know, on the travel industry. And, you know, one example in 2004, when, when the U.S. wanted to put pressure on Jamaica to make Aristide leave, they said, we're going to put a travel warning on Jamaica. We're going to say that Jamaica is too dangerous because of crime for American tourists to visit. And that would have caused a huge amount of pain in, you know, among working people in Jamaica who are dependent on those jobs. Um, yes. And, and, and it would have, and, and so, and Jamaica, you know, at, at, in 2004, they were able to, you know, Caricom and Jamaica were able to hold on. Jamaica could not hold on and keep Aristide there indefinitely. And they finally said, you know, we need to, you know, we can't do this. We have to, you know, set him up so we can go to the, to the, to the, to South Africa. But it was a huge pressure and the U.S. can do that today. They can say, hey, tomorrow, you know, if Jamaica doesn't do this. And that might have been part of why Jamaica put out that statement last week. There might have been pressure from the U.S. saying, you know, nice economy you've got there. And, you know, if travel warning would be very dangerous to you and we don't want to do that wow wow can i and you know i talk about the ability can I, the ability to issue travel warning you know that that's you know that you are a dependent capitalist country that is still serving people of the globe i talk about the global south and the global north and you know the book i write the you know looks at the penetration of the other of the external and it's quite interesting and um that you know, it's as if you, they have any rights, their hands are tied because you know who have the money. Show me the money, and you can then you have the talk, yeah. and that's very important. And you know, one of the students in the class said to me yesterday, said to me last week, sir, we should not define the Caribbean only in terms of our economics. And I said to him, the day when they in, when they invented money, <laughs> you know, and the day when they invented currency, was the day when you have to now start defining your country and yourself by currency. You know, because that is important. And if you don't have enough of it or have access to it, then you will be forever be kept down at the bottom. But I, I, I saw the letter you sent me, um, uh, Paul the Prince Haiti to Dr. This is Dr. Carla N Natalie Barnett, who is the Secretary General. Um, according to the letter dated November 4, 2022, dear Dr. Barnett, we are write, writing you in relation to the armed international intervention in Haiti that has been requested by Dr. Ariel Henry, the de facto Prime Minister of Haiti, and supported by the United States and Canada to explain that any support for the intervention by the Caribbean community would violate CARICOM's democratic principles, betray Haitians' centuries-long struggle for democracy and sovereignty, and implicate CARICOM in attacks against civilians exercising their basic human rights. Wow, this is powerful. This is a powerful, this is a long letter, guys. Um, uh, and I'm reading it for those who are going to be listening, who are joining the show. But let me, con he said, the letter goes on to say that ever since the, the intervention was proposed, Haitians have taken to the streets by the tens of thousands to oppose it. We have issued statements, spoken out in the media, and done anything else we could to let the world know that the intervention is designed to prop up the unconstitutional, corrupt, and repressing the de facto government and stifle legitimate dissent. De facto Prime Minister Henry ascended to his post, not through any Asian procedure, but through an announcement by the US-led core group. He had been nominated by President Jovel, Jovenel Moise of the party, um, of the PHTK. 
whose mandate had expired five months previously. Now, the PHTK has not run an election that was either fair or timely in the decade it has maintained power. According to the letter that I'm reading now, it is Parliament, it is Parliament became inoperative in January of 2020, and the terms of all local elected officials ended in July of that year. It is Supreme Court has lacked enough members, has lacked enough members to constitute a quorum since March. This situation constitutes a sharp departure from the right to a fair and open democratic system guaranteed by Article 6 of the CARICOM Charter of Civil Society. And it goes on and on and on and on. PHTK governance has been demonstrably brutal. In April of 2021, the Haitian Observatory, um, Observatory for Crimes Against Humanity and Harvard Law School issued a report establishing that gangs and government officials collaborated on deadly attacks against neighborhoods suspended on arboring political dissidents and voters opposed to PHTK. Now, during the current wave of protests, police have arrested dozens of dissidents. It's a long letter. I'm, I'm going to wrap up now because I know you're, you're following me here. Dissidents engage in legal protest activity and shot at legal demonstrations. Journalists have been shot and killed. Um, this represents, this repression constitutes severe violation of rights guaranteed by Articles Four, rights to life, liberty, security of the person, so on and so forth. Throughout the PHTK's rule, the powerful members of the international community have refrained from criticizing the government's human rights record in an exception that provides the rule in early 2018. I'm going to get back to this letter later on, but I'm going to end by saying Haitians are well aware that the most recent international armed intervention tasked with addressing gang violence in Haiti, the MINUSTA, was a deadly expensive failure, which spent $9 billion US over 13 years and left Haiti less democratic than when it arrived. This is quite, in, the United Nations also in, um, insulted Haitian people, caused enormous suffering and death and triumph on the rule of law by dumping cholera laden sewage in our rivers and refusing to comply with its legal obligations to repair the damage. Six years ago, the UN human rights expert, Philippe Alston, declared that the UN response goes directly against the principles of accountability, transparency, and the rule of law that the UN itself promotes um, globally. Promotes globally. The organization continued floating to its legal um, obligations. That is, this is quite interesting. And finally, in the end, in the end, Mario Joseph said, the Haitian people are today looking for CARICOM to extend the example the community set in 2004. Not betray it. We do not want our CARICOM sisters and brothers to come with guns to help powerful countries as if they are house slaves. I'm adding that. As if they are house slaves to impose a repressive regime on us. We want our sisters and brothers to come in solidarity with respect and democratic principles. We want CARICOM to once again insist that the international community stop supporting an unconstitutional imposed regime and allow Haitians to find a democratic, sustainable solution to our political crisis in solidarity. Wow, this is a this is a powerful letter, and I am going to get a chance to read it again and I'm to talk about it again. This is this is a powerful letter, powerful letter that we would get a chance to delve into. And just so you know, you will be, um, you're going to be in the, you're going to be talking with the class, my class, Caribbean Thought. Is it next week? Next week, Friday? Do we, uh, do we even have it set? I, I some kind of wasn't sure we had that actually set. Let me, let me check my, my calendar. Yes, um, but um, just so you know, guys, for those of us who have been watching this show, Delayed, or um, Brian will be on the show, and he's going to be talking with my, with, with the students at the Jamaican Theological Seminary. Uh, in fact, what we're going to do, we're going to open up his presentation. We're going to open up his talk. We're going to open up to the open it up to the entire school. We're going to open it up to the entire school, and we're going to have it uh, live, and where people can talk. We can we can have you can have a feedback, ask questions about your work and what's going on in Haiti and so forth, and you can give an address about your work and maybe we ask some of the stuff that we discussed. But this is this is great. This is great. And then uh, you know, I didn't think we get to talk to you about your life and what you do and what gets you up in the morning and what gives you tick. But you know. Um, what is it? What is it? What What is your inspiration? What is it that drives you? 
Because you know, you live, you're from the US, you lived in, the, in, in Haiti for a while, you came back because you say, you know, my work lies here. I have to work here. Okay. While the Caribbean, they need to work in Haiti. Work together. The Caribbean, we need to, that's what, okay. And then while some of us work, you know, it has to be strategic. But what is it that gets you up in the morning and that gets you going and, and ticking and so on? Mm -hmm. So ever since I was a little kid, I was always interested in justice. You know, the books I like to read, the movies I like to see, TV shows, the ones that involve justice were, were always my favorite. And, you know, I went to law school and, you know, again, because I really felt called to, to advance justice, I, you know, didn't have a very specific idea what that meant. Um, didn't think about, didn't, wasn't Haiti wasn't on my radar screen, but then I, you know, I had this opportunity when I decided I wanted to go into human rights work. Um, it was, you know, I had the great privilege of, of having an opportunity to work in Haiti and yeah, it's yeah. a great privilege because Haitians care about justice in ways that only people who've been deprived of it so much can, can, can understand. Um, and, but also, I mean, not only of Haitians are Haitians kind of the world champions of, 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 facing injustice they're also the world champions of fighting back i mean again they beat napoleon at his prime the only country i mean i'm sure almost every slave who ever existed has said you know i want independence haitians are the only ones who have a country that came from a slave revolt um and they've they've been repressed ever since if we if we've discussed colonized they've also never stopped fighting against that and for someone who okay. cares deeply about justice to be able to work with people who care so deeply and are willing to make so many sacrifices it, it's an absolute privilege i remember being in meetings where you know be kind of an afternoon meeting that went into the evening and i'm getting hungry and feeling kind of sorry for myself and then i realized yeah. you know i had lunch i had breakfast some of these people didn't have lunch or breakfast they're here fighting and i got to you know stop feeling sorry for myself and you know try yeah. to be as, as tough as they are um and you know so ever since then so there's a lot of positive motivations you know i'm afraid now a lot of negative motivations i'm you know i'm totally irate at the at the hypocrisy between you know what i felt i still feel are fundamental american ideals and human ideals of support for democracy. And, you know, as you know, with the same outrage you've expressed at that, you know, at this situation, I mean, it is just totally outrageous. And so, you know, part of me is fueled by the outrage that this is happening, you know, with my tax dollars, somewhat with my name and to people that, you know, I have such great admiration and respect for. Yes. Wow. 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 Powerful. You know, um, it's after 11 and we've been talking for a while and we, I am going to have you back. We're going to have you back on the show. You I look are forward to it. To come back on the show to comment on what's going on in Haiti, issues of justice. We're going to definitely have you back on the show to talk some more. And um, I think next, is it next week we can, I will look. I can't week, do it next week, uh, but yeah. uh, I look forward to, 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 to meeting with your class as soon as we can get that to work. Yes, yes, probably tomorrow. Um, <laughs> maybe next week. Man. And tomorrow I wrap up a lecture. And then probably, but we will talk about when you will come back and uh, we can have a discussion with you in the class. But thank you so much. To that. Thank you so well, thank much. Thank you so much. I have learned so much. And we are going to be, are we going to, we're going to join the movement. We're going to join the IJDH. IJ, IJDH. You got it. IJDH. You already joined the I movement. Got you got the IJDH. IJDH. <laughs> Guys, this is the man, man. He's been working and he reached out to me and I reached out to him. I saw the work that he was doing in Haiti, and I'm like, wow, there is somebody here working on it. I'm working to help make Haiti a better place. That is great. And so we are going to, and please, um, go, go. he's on Twitter, uh, Haitian Justice. Um, the Institute is also on Facebook. You're also on LinkedIn. And um, so you can visit them on um, IGD, IJDH.com. Is it .com or .org? .org. 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 IJDH .org. Um, uh, please, and it's a beautiful, beautiful image. I love the thumbnail icon that you have up there. Okay, so check them out, guys. They're doing a lot, a lot of work in in Haiti and by extension the Caribbean. Because as I said to you, there's a book that I read, which the students will get a chance to watch it either this week or next week. It's called Life and Death, written by Jamaica Kincaid. I mean, the book. Sorry, it's, it's a small place about Antigua that looks at IMF and structural adjustment policy. And then from there, you, uh, and then they, from there you have, from a small place, you had the book, you had the movie, Life and Death, the documentary film. And they talk about um, structural adjustment and the IMF and the World Bank and how things were 
affected of things that are affected in the Caribbean. But the thing, the beautiful thing about this this movie, Life and Death, it came from the book A Small Place. The book A Small Place is about Antigua, but the movie, which was based off the book, is about Jamaica. <laughs> I mean, the experiences are almost identical in the Caribbean. So I talk about the black, but as people, we have to work together. No matter who you are, white or black, no matter who you are. And I said, today, there's no race in the world. Race is a conception created in the 1600s to supply a theory. We, we'll talk about that later on. Okay. So, guys, let's all work together to improve each other. We are, what is the ultimate about it? The ultimate about things is that we become one with reality in all of our individuals. Hi, the God said, once you label me, you, once you label me, you negate me. So let us work together. Let's come together to make everybody a better experience, identifying and respecting the value of the person in relation to me. Because what is the goal in Do unto others as much as you want others to do unto you. And it is a recognition that you have, you have appropriately dealt with self so that you can appropriately dealt with this is the Nilo Burrow Podcast. Visit us at https www.thenilliberal.com. The, the, the podcast is anchor.fm slash the Nilo Liberal. We're on YouTube. We are on over 15 streams. We are heard globally, all over the world. Visit us and donate to the show because everything we offer is free. Anchor.fm slash the Nilo Liberal slash support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ronaldo. Thank you so much. Look forward to continuing this discussion. We will continue. We will continue because there's so much happening in Haiti right now. Um, I need to reach out to the people in Jamaica because there is, right? Um, the, there is a there is a there is a discussion going on in Jamaica right now as it relates to this particular story that you shared with me. And um, apparently, there are Jamaican government we are thinking about sending a troop there, which I completely yep. oppose to. Based on what I'm, please send the Mario's letter. I, I will send them the Mario's letter. I will. Send it to the Jamaican Gleaner as well. Okay, definitely. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And take care. Okay. Keep up your good work, Ronaldo. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.